Um, let's get going. And this is the, the last session, uh, the uh, round table. And uh, P Peter, wherever Peter disappeared to, yes, um, sort of uh, asked our distinguished guests here uh, to consider the question, and I quote him here, in the 19th century, many Indian social and religious reformers differentiated custom and rituals from true religion. Um, is this distinction still relevant for lived Jainism today? Um, is the question that he asked. And this is a question that um, is on the one hand has the historical um, importance of a set of issues and uh, topics and things that uh, certainly in the 19th and 20th centuries as, as Jane's dealt with all of the, uh, the changes that we think of as modernity, uh, urbanization, economic change, communication change, things like that, uh, totally new settings, you know, and Jane's uh, tried to adapt to that in different parts of India and outside of India, um, you know, sort of this, and the, the whole, concept of true religion started to emerge in the 19th century also. Um, I would say it's also a question that uh, is, is, he says, is relevant for live Jainism today um, as Jains move around and migrate and live in totally different circumstances in India, but also increasingly with m more than a, a lack of Jains living outside of India, the diasporic Jains also are considering these questions. Uh, and in some ways, it, it could be said, you know, what is Jainism? What is the, the Jain Dharm? Uh, what is Adhikar within the tradition? You know, what are sort of authoritative sources you go to figure out how to respond to the present? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that emerge out of this. And so we have a, uh, an illustrious panel up here. And um, as I, I'm going to introduce everyone very quickly and just raise your hand so that the audience can know. Um, and we'll start with... Uh, John, sorry, John, can I ask a quick question? This 19th century, is, I hope it's not got anything to do with British colonization. <laughs> no, it's the fact that the 19th century was a time of global change and reform. And I mean, the 19th century was obviously a time of rising colonialism in India, but it's also, regardless of the situation, everybody in the world was dealing with these changes and the idea of true religion and how do we sort of identify true religion vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, traditional custom, traditional rituals, you know, the rise of uh, textual authority, uh, these kinds of issues transcended colonialism. Yeah, because I, I'm asking because... Uh, uh, Atul? Can I ask you to actually keep that and, and transform that into your opening comment? <laughs> and, 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 and in your opening comment, you can therefore deconstruct the question. <laughs> That's perfectly legitimate. I will do that. Okay. But in the meantime, I would like to introduce people. Uh, first, uh, from Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Technology, Rurki, we have Ashok Jain. Oh, you're not even on stage here. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, Department of Botany, Gwalior University, also Ashok Jain. Okay, no relation. <laughs> um, and uh, you all now know Atul Shah from the uh, University Campus Suffolk. Raise your hand, Atul, yes. Uh, Batarakji Charukirti, Jain Matmud Bidri, who's been a wonderful participant here. Uh, from University of Southampton, we have Bindi Shah. Uh, Chakresh Jain from the JP, uh, JP Institute of Information Technology, New Delhi. Is, uh, yeah, okay, all the way down at the end. Uh, in, in the shadows, unfortunately. Um, from SOAS and Jain Vishwabharati Ladnun, we have Samani Pratibha Pragya. Thank you. Uh, we've all heard already. Sanjeev Sogadi from Gyan Sagar Science Foundation. And Shamlal Godawat from Gyan Sagar. And who have I, if I missed somebody? Um, so what I'm going to ask is... Nimal Kumar Jain. Dr. Kalyan Swain. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get your... Dr. Kalyan Malgangwal. Okay. Not on the... Okay, Kalyan Jain. Okay. What I'm going to do is ask each of the people to respond to this question in literally about two minutes. <laughs> 
um, because it, that will then take us to about half past and that will then leave time for about 20, 25 minutes of Q&A. Uh, there will be microphones and we have two people carrying the microphone so we can have it as more of a round table conversation. Um, so just to be completely arbitrary, why don't we start here with uh, Shamlal. Answer to this question. Should I start? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Should I start first? Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, this is very important questions that uh, uh, whether such reforms uh, they are really relevant or uh, and, uh, and they have differentiated customs and rituals from the true religion. Change is the law of nature. We can't change. As we progress, certainly changes take place. So happened with case of religion also. So happened with our religious practices, our rituals also. So to this question, I again raise some questions. Can we go back? Can we go back to our original customs or rituals which we were practicing? And second question is, can we promote people to follow totally the path of salvation? Because in Jainism, Earlier, there was no, uh, there was no way, there was no question of any kind of tantrism. Tantrism was developed later on, but originally the main principle of Jain was to purify your soul. Then, can we take people back to that path? No. So many people adopted, and they practiced. They started practicing various types of tantric practice. Tantrism. And certainly it happens when they worship any gods and goddesses, then certainly, like Yakshi Yakshani or like several other deities are there, so it started, they started worshipping them also. And many other things they also entered in this tantric practices. For example, in Digambar tradition, when we perform any kind of puja, when we perform any kind of bidhan, a big form of puja, which comprises several pujans, worship, in that case, there was no place for inviting God or for requesting them to stay or when we complete the puja or bidhan, then we never bid any welfare. Such type of thing was not there. But it entered later, it was introduced later, because according to Jain principle, our God, he is in Siddha Shala. He is the super soul. They <coughs> never come back on this earth. Then why, why we, we call them? Why we request them to stay, sthapana? Then pujan and then visarjan. We do like that. So there are several such examples, but we can't check it. We have to live with them. Another thing is, such practices, in my opinion, they have not harmed in any way. People who practice such type of tantrism, they do it. People who do not practice such type of tantrism, they do not it. They do not do it. They do not believe in such type of practices. So my submission is that people know very well about the introduction of tantrism and about its influence on main principles of Jainism. So whatever people are doing, doing, let them do, and it is not going to affect any way <coughs> in any principle of Jainism. Thank you very much. I would like to add something, what is told by the Dr. Ashok Jain, that is the Jainism is the entirely based on the philosophy. It is based on the spirituality. It is based on the salvism. But however, in the ancient time, there was completely belief on the spirituality. Later on, the time passes, the people complete their desire, needs, and the, to solve their problems. They took the help of the mantras. Later on, again, the time passes. That comes to the mantra yuk. Earlier, there was the spirituality yuk. Then there was the mantra yuk, mantra era. Later on, the people's the time has passed on. Then they took the addition of the tantra yoga, and then the 
Yantra Yoga later on. So the present era is the Yantra Yoga in which the Mantra, Tantra and the Yantra, all the three are involved. So in the present circumstances, people wants peace, people wants calm, cool, happiness. So to achieve this thing, to achieve this goal, the people take the help of this mantra, yantra, and the tantra. So for obtaining the peace, these mantra, tantra, and yantra are operative in the present circumstances. So in this present circumstances, there is no harm because we all are the mundana soul. We are the chadmasta jeev. And to complete our the desires, we are taking the help and the people are taking the help of the mantra, tantra and the yandra. So for the spirituality and for the growth of the spirituality in the present circumstances, the peoples are taking the help of the mantra, tantra and the yandra. So in the jhana, entirely based that the body and the soul, they are the separate. So for the upliftment of the soul, the peoples are the taking the help of the mantra, tantra, and the yantra in the present circumstances. But in principle, the Jain philosophy is entirely based on the spirituality and on the philosophy and the salvation. Thank you very much. Okay. Om Sri Vitaragaya Namaha. Means totally in our aim is upliftment soul without any harm. So technique is so many is uh, we will observe in since so many years. Influence is everywhere and every moment how to we will live and let live, how to we survive. In that sense, so many regions, so many type of the challenges is coming. In colonial era, and we know that uh, we are living in five, six, seven type of languages and so many customs in our South Kendall district, undivided district. There is Muslims, we are, uh, uh, give the land to the belt, they are masculine. And there are so many Christians, we are, give the land to make belt to the church. And there are several Hindus, cult, the Vedic and Shaiva, we are give the land to build their temple and we will rule. And also in their Dravidian culture, schedule caste and schedule tribe, in that three, four, five sections, in there also so many type of the technique tantra, in so many type varieties of the tantric is there. But in that tantric uh, control purpose, we are making some mantras, but it's absolutely non-violently, not violence. We are not encouraged in the Batarakas in Mudbidri and the surroundings, 15 Batarakas in the Karnataka. The challenge is, is so many types. They will meet and they will kill the animals, put the Ajna Yaga and all. When the, our Batarakas came, they stopped the Ajna Yaga, uh, buffaloes and uh, so many cows are uh, in name of God, the killing. So that's why influence is singing music and too many type of the dances and so many type of the miracles. That miracles is the yaksha pujas. Whenever the flower is down, then you don't kill the animal. The Devi is getting angry. So then they will stop the uh, uh, buffaloes uh, killing. This is the evidence in the 100 years ago in the Mudbidri. And all the British uh, leaders, viceroys, they are the protect our temple. Uh, in that time, uh, 1916, Clive Rice and so many great contribution to the Jains, especially our temple is preserved. But our Bataraka is never give the Sistine temple, only give the tomb and one of the palace for one part for the protection purpose. But he asked the heritage we don't uh, destroy that purpose. Uh, Bataraka is uh, telling commitment to the British. Uh, we never destroy our heritage. So that type of the kind, that type of the friendship, that type of the relations, I think, build up our harmony and peace. That is uh, five type peace. One is the manasika swastya, is the mental-based peace. Another one is the body peace. 
or body health, uh, mental health, body health, and is the neighbor health. A neighbor is very friendly, no challenges, no enemies, no need any tantra or technique. And fourth one is the uh, parivarik swastha, is the family uh, friendship, uh, the wife and the husband, kids and the parents, that relationship must very good build up. So it is a challenge for the spirituality and the religion. Religion nothing but uh, the teaching of morality or ethical. How we will wonderful uh, greatness or goodness and salvation we will learn from this earth. That is important, not in name of Jaina. It's a name of uh, reality, path of purification. So that path of purifications, our Batarkas or Kund Kund Acharya, some are written about non-violence and truth. No name in Jain. They are telling you will follow the truth. You follow the non-violence. You follow the celibacy. You follow the uh, non-attachment, like that. So this kind of uh, challenges are very easily, they will understand and give the influences in there. And another one is the uh, Manasika Swastya, Sharirika Swastya, Parivarika Swastya, and Samajika Swastya, in the neighboring nations and the other peoples, how we will live. We are the human being. The whole world is our house. We are the family member. This is the Lord Mavira's live and let live. All the living being is the soul. Even he is also great victor. And all the you people becoming one day great God. That is the Jain, Jainism's main motto and essence. So everybody you respect. Even all the living being and the plants and the creature, everybody. Om Shanti. Okay. Oh, you're going last. Okay. Uh, thank you. So um, I want to just state, well, thank Peter for inviting me to join this roundtable. But I also just want to say, uh, make my academic training very clear. I'm not a Jaina Studies scholar. I'm a sociologist. And uh, my research interests are related to questions of identity, community, belonging, and citizenship among the children of Asian immigrants in both the UK and, and the USA. So given that over the last few years, I've been doing research on young Jains in the two countries, aged 18 to 30 years of age. And sociologically, I call them second generation Jains because they're either um, born of uh, Jain immigrant parents who came to the UK, the USA in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, or they arrived with their parents at a very young age. And in this research, I've been interested in, in questions of how are young Jains interpreting Jain Dharma? How are they practicing it? What meaning does this practice have in their lives? How are they transforming and translating Jain Dharma in new settings? Uh, and finally, what kind of communities and community organizations are they building? in new settings. Now, um, I don't have too, many, too much time to go into the details of my findings, but I just want to briefly preface my position on this question for the round table by saying that in my findings, um, the majority of my participants, and I interviewed 30 young Janes in the UK and 30 in the USA, the majority are not interested in any kind of overt ritual practice on a regular basis. Very, very few of them uh, practiced uh, Samaic or any kind of austerities. None of my participants in Britain went to the temples, and we have several temples around the country on a regular basis. In the US, the young people did go to the temples on a, on, on a fairly regular basis, on a fortnightly basis, but partly because in the US, temples are also community centers, and so they draw young people for other kinds of reasons. The one overt kind of ritual or festival that has come to have much significance for young people in uh, the UK and the USA is Parushan or Das Lakshan. 
They take time out of their busy lives to observe this religious festival uh, by observing restrictions, further restrictions on their diet, uh, by performing fasts or pratekama, at least on the last day, if not on other days, and by going to listen to uh, lectures and things like that. So that sort of uh, very brief sketch of my findings, what I want to argue is that it's relevant to maintain this distinction between customs and rituals and the true dharma for three reasons. And I'll just, uh, if you allow me, just um, explain those three reasons. The first is that for many of my respondents, practicing the dharma in their daily lives provided a moral compass for them. It allowed them to become a good person. And particularly when young people are living in multicultural societies, in multi-faith societies, where there are multiple value systems. Jain principles such as ahimsa, anekantva, aparigra, and so on, and the related codes of conduct help young Jains navigate these multiple value systems uh, and often conflicting value systems. So just to give you one quick example, in the United States particularly, my respondents uh, said that there's violence in US society at multiple levels. And Jain principles and the codes of conduct that go with it help these young people make decisions about how to navigate the, these levels of violence that they encounter in order to try and be a good person. Second reason why I think the distinction is important to maintain is that young Jains in my study are living in a time and a place where there is a complexity of living, where social change is happening rapidly and intensely, and, and John mentioned some of that. Um, and the number of choices that young people have to make is expanding enormously. There's a lot of risk and uncertainty in the lives of young people. And particularly for young Janes, this risk and uncertainty is related to decisions about jobs and careers, but also more frequently now, it's related to health and chronic illness, particularly amongst their loved ones and, and nearest and dearest. So for many of my participants, understanding the true religion helps them deal with these uncertainties and risks in society in modern life. It helps them to control the negative emotions during difficult times. And I just wanted to give you one example of a young woman whom I interviewed. And she said to me that her understanding of karma theory helped her deal with the fact that she was not able to find a job in the financial industry in London, and this was a job that she was trained for. In describing how she dealt with the emotional up and ups and downs of not being able to find the job that she was trained for, she said, and I'll quote, I took away that attachment to what I really, really wanted. I opened it up a little bit more and then actually got a really good job, end of quote. This job was not in the financial sector, but what she found was that the job that she eventually got revealed to her her true calling. But what she said was that it allowed her to maintain equanimity in these emotionally difficult times. Finally, what I want to argue is that distinction is important because it allows young Jane women and men to develop a committed Jane practice, religious practice. So the majority of the young women in my study uh, were going to universities that were very prestigious universities or they were involved in occupations that were very demanding and competitive. They had little time to perform any kind of rituals. They had little time to deal with any kind of diastry restrictions or timings and so on. So focus on the true religion allows them to develop a committed Jain practice that revolves around living the Dharma in their daily lives. It revolves around being vegetarian or increasingly vegan now and also involves being involved in regular Jain study. Um, the, and the one point in the year when they do take time out of their busy schedules is during Parushan or Das Laksham. But I also want to say that this distinction between uh, rituals and customs and true religion is important for young Jain men. 
it allows young Jain men to also develop a committed Jain practice that goes beyond just giving donations to the temple or goes beyond taking on positions within Jain organizations. Like Jain young women, it allowed young Jain men to also uh, develop dharma in, in their daily lives, to live the dharma in their daily lives, to uh, also make sure they're vegetarian or vegan, and also to be involved in a regular study of Jain texts, Jain stories, and Jain prayers. So for these reasons, young Jains who are growing up in, in the so-called West, it's important to maintain this distinction so they can actually maintain a committed Jain practice. Thank you, John. I will take your lead and deconstruct the question. So the first thing uh, I see is 19th century. And I think of the history uh, of the colonial history of India. And the colonial tantra was divide and rule. Divide and rule. The Jain tradition, as I understand it, and the Jain dharma, the Jain science, has never had boundaries throughout its life and throughout its uh, heritage. So, is, and the, the other thing I highlighted here is, is this distinction still relevant for lived Jainism today? Lived Jainism, first, well, I guess I could de deconstruct the word Jainism because that also creates a kind of boundary. Uh, but lived Jainism is diverse. It has got all kinds of manifestations. Uh, it's, this question seems to me to be akin to this idea of life. Is there, a, is there a, a boundary between life and religion? Not so in the Jain tradition, never has been, but uh, Western science and the way uh, Western religion often are constructed is as if there is a boundary but we have never had one. And I don't think that uh, from that context also, and I guess the last real javelin I want to throw, John, is we, we are all members of the Jain community. And is the agenda behind this question to divide and rule us? Thank you. Thank you so much for this, Peter, having this roundtable conference and giving the opportunity of speaking here. Uh, the religion is what actually I cannot defini de definitely define it to some of the, in the sum of words, but what I can say is, is the true moral values or ethics which one can have with that and I give a very simple example of that. You have a gold coin of weighing more than one kg of one million pound, and it's being hammered by everything, and then asked, who will take it? Everyone say, yeah, whatever, and if it deforms, it has a value. And after that also, it has been put into the mud, into the shed, and it's still asked, who is going to take it? Everyone says, yeah has value of one million pound. So similarly, people say if you have a values, if you have trouble of the ethics, moral values, people will hands you up to take you through the salvation path even. So some of Acharya says that if you have developed ethics values, moral values through religion or by any ways of religion, maybe it deforms, maybe it change with the time, but it remains, the moral values and ethics remains the same. So it's like a value of gold or coin. And furthermore, Acharya says that, you know, people after dying goes to heaven who has done the good karma. But the main real person is that where he stands, where he sits, heaven comes there before he dies. 
That's the type of uh, spirituality if he has developed in him. Like some of Acharyas are if sitting there and if you go, you'll find so much of positive energy, you feel that you are in heaven. So if that kind of spirituality or that kind of purity of soul is being developed by you, then, you know, heaven will be like here only. So that's what I wanted to highlight that, you know, uh, some of this, like we are, uh, for the salvation path is true religion. Once one has to has got to salvation, that's true. So if, but we are, someone says that, you know, like a child, if he's weeping, then you give him a toy give him a toy and say, okay, he's happy. Similarly, uh, if we are on the salvation path, we are child, like, you know, we are, we are very still uh, on that path, it will remain child. So, uh, if some mantra and tantra has been given to you, then it is like you giving you the happiness or something like that. You know, the bell mantra, I'll just uh, uh, read in Hindi, but uh, someone of can understand this is being basically for your wealth, your happiness, keeping you away from the uh, illness. Or Om Rim Ghanta Karno Mahavir Savyadi Vinashke Visphodam Vya Pravate Rashash Mabla Yatatam Titere Devli Khota Shavantibi Rogast Panchanti Vatpit Kavudva Tatura Nasti Yanti Kane Japatakshan Om Rim Ghanta Karno Mahavir Savyadi Vinashke Visphodam Vya Pravate. So this is being practiced every day and this is basically for keeping you protected from outside world and giving you the path where you want to go. So uh, with these words I'll say that if there are some deforms also, if it is for good, it is being accepted with time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have very uh, a small interpretation uh, for uh, my own understanding. Uh, as in the Jainism, there is a it is state with a concept of ahimsa, parmo, dharma, live and other allowed to live. Religion, which is purely saying about the internal realization and beauty at the internal side. External devices may be like, uh, I mean, as it is a topic also for today's Tantrism, Jainism, Yantrism. These all being basically the component which might be sometime giving you a uh, possibility to find. But in nutshell, what I feel that Jainism is totally for the self-realizations. These external devices may be helpful up to a certain extent. And with this upcoming, this modern era, the necessity of these all things may be taken up in, in concept to, without compromising with her Jain philosophy. This is what I actually want to conclude myself. Thank you. So, Samadhi Ji, do you want to yeah. sort of? Thank you, John. And I'm drawing upon Ole Quastom's growth and survival. Very important article, though he's talking about the 12th century, but taking on the 19th and 20th, 20th century, the, in Jainism, we have two words, Mulgun and Uttargun. So Mul, the Mul is always static, not changing, but Uttar is constantly changing for the survival and growth. And that's why now the community concentrated on Rajasthan, on Gujarat, and then beyond the boundaries, and now we can say more than 50 countries, and there are Jains, a diaspora, and a lot more changes. So survival and growth, when I see the dark side of it, when I see that some of them adopted known ways in their eating, known ways and sometime leathers and some, some sort of things in their daily life, then why this is? And then they say, we have to sit in a community, we have to sit, we have peer pressure, we have different community and business and this and that. So there, I think it is a big question for Zionism, but they said we do for the survival. But 
side by side, there is a lot more changes. And when I see a people, a group of like Gyan Sagar Foundation, and they are here with a different vision. They are looking for a new island of the knowledge. And they, they have the idea, okay, we did enough Panchkalyanak, we did enough for puja, we did enough for temple, and now they are looking for something new. And this is also uh, keeping the true religion in their mind, but they are looking for the institutionalized Jainism. Here at Savas, they find that type of island. And I think first Ashok Jain traveled, and now, and maybe in the coming years, this collaboration will enhance, and maybe the SOAS Jaina conference, maybe they can host sometime in India. They can, they can do something more than that. So it is opening a window in their mind, and they are keeping the true religion in their mind, and for the survival and growth, for the Jainism, uh, thinking in a different way. So I think it is also the custom and ritual. They are one side of religion, but knowledge and progressing knowledge and making research for the coming generation. Uh, so that is a different uh, step for the generation, for the Jainism. So this is my thinking and what I got from Gurudev Tulsi and Gurudev Mahapragya as Peter did a lot more research, Jain modernization, Jain modernism. So that is also one factor of it, the survival and growth and reaching far away from the foot stepping of the true religion, keeping the foot on the true religion, but progressing. So thank you. So Mr. Jain, Mr. Peter, and my friends, well, as a physician, I have come here, but for the last 40 years, I am trying to spread the Jainism and Jain thoughts all over the world, and particularly propagating the vegetarianism. Now, today in this conference, well, though it was on a Tantra, but I think this is a base where the Lund University, SOS, and Jain community from India all should come together to guide the world. In fact, when I move all over the world, I find today the main burning point is a global warming, and the solution for a global warming is basically is Jain following the Jain principles. Because I see that Jain dharma, it is not a religion, it is a way of life. It is a way of life, it is not a religion at all. And large number of people can come together and we can, we, we can save this globe, save this globe. I do remember I, when I was in Dublin, I saw in a Trinity Museum the Bernard Shaw's line when I were not sure, I was saying that if want to re have a rebirth, I would like to have a rebirth in India, and that too also in a Jain Dharma. There's a lot of things in Bernard Shaw's saying. The similarly, I feel that today, uh, Al Gore, in his, uh, all his book and CDs, you must have seen, The Inconvenient Truth, or Rajendra Pachori, they're all spreading that how to save the globe from the warming and so many other future, uh, non-violence, and their only thing is a platform, is a Jain way of life. I think to propagate vegetarianism, to propagate non-violence, we should have one platform from your university, Peter Ji, Bhattarak Ji, all the Jain community from India, we should come together and take this message of Tirthankara and Mahavir to the world, because that is going to give the light to the world, and that is a change which we have seen in 19th century and 20th century. As a doctor, I see today why the medical problems are growing, why 90% of the disease, 95% of the patients I get are all having suffering from psychosomatic disorder. And there's for all the psychosomatic disorder, there's no answer at all unless we change our lifestyle. And that is the reason why the Jain principles, Jain way of living, we should try to propagate and put in front of the world so that we can do a lot for this community, lots for this world. I thank all of you, and particularly, I listen to the number of intellectual people, and I'm going with the message, but definitely, 
I think this should be a new platform to grow and just suggested by Shamani ji, why not to have a conference, similar conference, where a large of the foreign delegates, they come to the India and we would love to host them and make this message to the global message. This Thank you very much. Many panelists. Uh, Sas, I think uh, letter uh, people is read, I think. Manipal Mahe University already we will done. Sas and jointly. Sas, it's Sas or what? Jaina International. Uh, yeah. Course, yeah. Summer, yeah. Summer, yeah. Course. summer courses yeah. we will last month uh, last 15 days before in Manipal we will attend that one okay and also I will uh, tell to sauce and Peter Flugel and uh, mr. Yeah. John. 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 Uh, most welcome if you will uh, arrange uh, the, the conference jointly do in Murbidri I will support you food and accommodation <laughs> And any other university people also most welcome. This is your second house. <laughs> such, such kind offers here. Um, before we, we turn over the microphones to everybody, there was one person who was supposed to be up here on the stage, Ashokji. Uh, would you like to have a, a word or? Yes, OK. And Ellen has got the microphone. No, no, just you. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I will remain focused on the question that you have posed. And uh, it's a very relevant question. It has many dimensions. So I cannot touch all the dimensions. First of all, let me tell you that I am not a uh, so-called, uh, I mean, uh, in the usual sense, an expert on Jainism. I am a nuclear physicist, and if you ask me to give a lecture on nuclear fission, I can do that for several hours very easily. But uh, I was brought up in a family which was kind of uh, full of Jain religion. My father was a great scholar on Jainism. All the Jain scholars, all the Jain pundits that used to come to my house. So starting from my childhood, I have seen every hue of Jain scholars, Jain pundits, and I have played with them in their laps. I used to ask them many kind of stupid questions. I have read hundreds of books that used to come to my house. So that with that background, I grew up, but I never wanted to become a Jain scholar myself. I chose physics. And this is what is happening actually today also. There are several dimensions, as I said. One dimension is, the Jain religion being practiced in India. Then the Jains who are abroad and their children. And then our own children who are growing up in India. My son is there. He never wants to go to the temple. Then what to do, I mean? The way Jainism is being practiced within India in the Jain community the rituals, number of rituals are definitely increasing. Those rituals never existed when I was young. I never saw my father practicing so many rituals. Why they are increasing? I think the main reason is economical. People are getting prosperous. Then there are so many new generation of pundits coming up who don't have jobs. They promote these rituals. <laughs> Yes, they, they promote these rituals because then they go and perform. See, in Jain, one thing was there, in the Jain temples, there are no priests. If you go to a Hindu temple, there will be a priest, a middleman, who will accept the donations, who will take everything on behalf of the God and say, oh, it will reach the God now. <laughs> this, never, this is the reason Jains were simple people. Hmm. The temples were very simple places. You go and do puja yourself. Whatever prayer you have to do, you go. Nobody is there between you and the God. So this principle is now being violated very seriously. And I am totally against this. Because now when you go to any Jain festivals or any such places, the kind of elaborate arrangements and the expenses they are just against this principle of non-violence and everything. They are simply against it. 
they violate every Jain ethic. The simplicity is lost, the main purpose is lost. You talk about salvation every day, who wants salvation? Nobody wants to solve it. Where is the salvation? Show me. I don't see it. Now, how do you show it to the young people? You have to do that in a very different way. You know, they, they, they want logical answers. They don't want just some statements from some uh, stories from scriptures. So, when I tell my son to come to me with me to the temple, he says, why should I go? I am I'm living a much better life than people who go there. So, these are the questions that are being faced within the country. And then some of the questions were raised by uh, the lady here who has done such a wonderful study and she posed many questions. So we have to, however, do the rituals, are, do we need rituals? I think some rituals are definitely needed because laymen, they remain rooted in that way. Some of the rituals keep you rooted to the basic things. Even if you don't, have, you are not a great philosopher or a great learner or a great a scholar, you know, they keep people rooted to the some of the basic things. They go there, they listen to somebody, and so they learn few things. In that sense, rituals are almost necessary. But I don't know how this. I have read a lot about tantra mantra, but I really don't know. I have not come across any evidence where they work proper. How do they work? how they are doing their job. So these questions come to the mind and they have to be answered in a, in a rational way. So I think uh, I have so many other things to say, probably I, don't, I won't take much time, but my view will be that you have to keep the rituals under control. They have to be kept to the minimum that are necessary. You have to you have to interpret the basic tenets in the modern time in a new way so that young generation will be able to accept it. This is very necessary if you want this whole principle, to this Jain religion to survive in the future. Whole survival depends on that. So with these words, I thank you very much. I hope. Uh... Yes, thank you. Um, we have after all of these wonderful um, sh presentations of various perspectives from different uh, sort of places within India, different social locations, things like that, that have raised enough questions that we could have an entire second day of a conference, um, but we don't have a second day. We have about five minutes, so. <laughs> um, I will, I, I, there, there are two hands that are very energetically being raised in the back, so. Um, thank you. Um, so in, in light of the question, differentiating between custom and rituals from true religion, I think one thing that's sort of failed to be, to, uh, be addressed is at what point does custom and ritual become true religion? I mean, if you practice austerities, surely there's some austerities that w could be classified as true religion. I mean, I don't think that's been quite, uh, quite discussed. I was just wondering what, 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 what um, the speaker's views are um, on the extent to which customs and rituals could become true religion and how, how you could differentiate between the two of them. So, any, any thought? Thank you. Um, actually, why don't, we have the, the, why don't we have three questions and then we'll let the, the panelists respond as they want. So, so first of all, thanks to the speakers for taking time out of your busy schedule and sharing your uh, thesis. And you covered a very interesting topic, um, you know, uh, but it's a very specific topic. Jainism is much beyond it. So my question to the speakers today is, uh, um, if you take three things out of Jainism, what would you like to share? What are the three things that you want to share? So maybe it's non-violence, maybe it's an ekant uh, multiplicity of truth. But, but when you share, please share a little bit one line out of it so that uh, people may not understand what an ekant is. So when you say, what are the, your three things? Uh, that you really like about Jainism that everyone should take in this, uh, in this uh, world. Okay, a third question and then we'll sort of... Hi, um, <clears throat> my name's Sagar. I just wanted to quickly refer um, to the doctor who was talking about vegetarianism and um, the lady that was talking about the research she's done on the students. Um, 
so it was great to see what I'd seen today, a lot of stuff I didn't know. But in terms of the problems that we are encountering um, in the world today, whatever religions or denominations we come from, which is to do with the ecology and the climate change, um, there is one aspect which is the vegetarianism and all the chemicals and pollutants. And my question is with regards to um, what I see as the dharma and what I see as the rituals, for the last 10 years when I've been practicing Ayurveda for myself in terms of medicine, people just see it as medicine, but for me it's not just medicine, it's a whole way of life. And we've become so uh, distant and isolated from that. And then what we then see that in the form of in the West, we see that in the form of science. And I would like to ask the people on the panel that if we are really going to go back to what the layman person would understand of what is Jainism, not, not this high level stuff, is how do we actually reclaim the natural sciences, the natural biologies, the natural systems which were there for thousands of years and gave the basis of a lot of the things we have today. So if, if I can, um, I, I'm gonna have to intervene and, and just, we, we have three questions here and sort of if anyone wants to respond holistically, um, the, the one question of some one of the more, main things. One more question in the back. Yeah. Okay. One more. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think if, if I can summarize all of these into one grand question <laughs> with a couple minutes, um, I mean, it seems to me that, that, that what has emerged here in a number of ways is actually um, a representation of a, um, a tension, and I use that in a creative word, that, that has long existed in Jainism, actually from the very beginning, of the interaction between Kriya, that which is done with the body, and Gyan, that which is sort of the knowledge. and. Um, that's a problem that certainly people in contemporary India are wrestling with and also uh, outside of India. Um, how do you balance the actions which sort of uh, allow you to bodily remember the religion and also remain the, uh, focus on the, the abstract uh, disembodied ideals in that way? That's a huge question. Anyone want to take that on for 60 seconds? And, I don't want to take on your question, but I want to just respond to a couple of the yeah. questions there. Um, I think the first question I asked, uh, at what point do rituals become religion, right? Um, I agree, actually, ritual, it, my, this is not my, what I state was my finding. So my opinion is that rituals are actually part of true religion. What the young people that I studied had a problem with was that they said that their parents and their grandparents, and of course it doesn't include any of the grandparents and parents here, but their parents and grandparents performed rituals unthinkingly, that they performed them or they went to the temple, going to the temple was very important, doing some mic was very important to them. But then when they had finished that, the next minute they would become angry and agitated over the smallest of things that they weren't able to develop this sense of equanimity uh, or apply Jain principles in all, their in all aspects of their lives. And they, they found that very disappointing. They found that sort of you know, inauthentic in many ways. And, and so many of the young people are turning to, uh, to Parushan, for instance, but they're trying to reclaim the spirituality in those rituals and how the spirituality can then help them on their path to uh, samyak darshan and, and so on. So uh, I'm not arguing that rituals cannot be true religion, but this is what they see around them uh, and they're trying to reclaim some of it uh, in their own way. Um, to the third question about uh, Ayurveda, um, there's a lot of debate amongst young people and particularly um, in the US, and I'm sure Christopher Chapel and some of the other uh, US-based scholars will, will probably be aware of it, um, about vegetarianism versus veganism, okay, and the impact of these diets. So there is actually a lot of thinking going on. Uh, you know, young Jains are, are pursuing very scientific 
professions so that they know the science. They also know, um, they know the science. They, they, know the, they know the Western science. I know you're shaking your head. They know the Western science. Um, and they're trying to apply it. A growing number are trying to apply it through becoming vegan, okay? Because they see that as having even less of an impact on the environment. Now, Ayurveda is a different system, and you know, growing up, growing up in the Western countries, many of them are medical doctors, and so allopathic systems are very different to Ayurvedic systems, and so there is a, a kind of a clash between the two. But what you're asking is, I think, a different kind of a question. But what I would say is that many of the young people are aware of science and are aware of their impact on the earth. Uh, and they're trying to sort of figure out ways of living lives that are less impactful. And one, one way to do that is through pursuing a vegan kind of lifestyle. Not, not everyone, but a growing number. Uh, I uh, explain uh, three things. Uh, one is Ahimsa, Aparigraha, Anekanta. Three dimension is very important. And also, uh, rituals is also need. Philosophy, logic also need and festival and celebrations also need. No one is immediately born and ethically philosopher. In primary knowledge, they will want rituals and go to temple and do the pujas. This is six essentials. So otherwise we are unbelievers, where the believers means that we must follow uh, uh, in the Jainism philosophy. It's the right faith, right knowledge, and right conduct. So it's the clear. Rituals also need, music also need. Tantra means not like that tantra, it's the uh, worst tantra, we are not accept it. It's tantra means technique like machine, which one is easier to understand the people, non-violence and multi-dimension of understanding. Some uh, people is uh, very, very um, angrily telling the mantras, Om, Ram, Rim, Rum, Ram, Raha, like that, same thing, we also uh, chanting, recite, and oh, he also very great uh, monk and great uh, tantric. Then they give, don't give there any disturbance. Like that, in the so many music and art and dance, music, everything is need. Without, uh, we, Adinath Tirthankar is, says all the color, 72, art. We can't ignore, uh, so, we look, hold the globe non-violently and harmony with culture, heritage, everything need. How to utilize, how to don't waste, without waste, ecological globalization and how to friendly, eco-friend life, social animal, human being. So how we will friendly with the other religion, other people, and how we will uh, eat food uh, with nature, uh, n n naturally it's uh, friend friendly with the body, healthy. That's why veganism is also important and also sometimes it's the giant veg food. It is not a veganism, some kind of minimize himsa. So that's why Ayurveda is also important. Some Ayurveda garlic and onion is Ayurveda, Jainism not accept it. So Jaina Ayurveda is a little bit different. So medicine, uh, man shuddhi, vachana shuddhi, kaya shuddhi. One is world's challenge. One is how we will live healthy body, how we will healthy think, and how we will healthy talk. That is important challenge in this world. I, I, I think at that point, I, I am going to have to cut it off because we've had an appropriate ritual end by having some words of wisdom from Batarak Ji. So thank you for everyone. Um, and Peter, the, the floor is yours. Joan's question. Just, just one thing I'd like to say. I'm not a scholar myself, but when we're looking at true religion and we're looking at rituals and customs, is the time cycle not a part of it at all? Do, does the panel not feel that the current time cycle we're in has a lot of influence into why so many rituals and customs are followed now 
to what was followed when Mari Pragwan was around, or two and a half thousand years ago, where true religion was being practiced. In the current state, that type of religion, I think, is almost impossible to practice, because we don't have that capability uh, as, as humans on, on the planet. I don't think the, the right kind of vibrations are around on the planet. Um, I don't think that um, the sort of acharyas and the sort of high, great spiritual people we've had, kun kun acharya, all of them are not on the planet anymore. So if rituals and customs were not practiced to the depth they practice now, the religion would die. There would be nothing. So to keep communities and to keep people and to keep some kind of a legacy for a religion, for Ahimsa, I don't think there is any choice for communities. I don't think there is a choice. And I think in a lot of ways, that's probably why where even like, say, for example, with uh, Pajoshan, you know, we have it once a year, but it's not like followed like it used to be followed when I was a young girl. Now it's become a big festival. It becomes, it's almost like a function. You know, you don't just go and do your pratikam, and after that, there's like a social event. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's just, just my input, how I feel, and, you know, what I've seen as growing up. Okay, thank you. path but the reason why in the current climate is because in Jainism and in other Eastern philosophy there is a beautiful word called bow and if you understand the meaning of rituals if you can f imbibe those invoking and the true piousness of those rituals then I think it it is a vehicle to take you to uh, whether it's mantras or whatever uh, to true religion and that path and on that journey that we heard today the word on third journey. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, Atu, uh, you can tell a lot of things because these young people, now they are really trained. They have learned so much uh, of Jainism rituals, uh, uh, Samaik and uh, Pratikaman, and uh, these young people, because they have learned so much, now they are teaching, and so many other young gents are involved. So Atul, I think, can say something more, because he was the founder president. Thank you. Uh, I just, I guess, Tantra is never fixed. I mean, I, it, you just reminded me, we, we started a practice called Experiments with Jainism, and we wrote about it as well. And we did uh, a series of experiments around Jain principles where we, for a week, we observed a principle and kept a daily diary to see how it felt as young people living in modern Britain, whether it is practical to live a Jain way of life. Uh, so Tantra is never fixed and I think uh, we can and we should uh, be creative about inventing new ways of uh, explaining and practicing uh, the traditional values and, and, and make them attractive to young people. Thank you. Thank you. On that note. So can we have a round of applause for the panelists here and for all of you? I'm going to have the last word. Pete, Pete well, okay. Peter, do you have the microphone? No, I have the microphone. Oh, you, so Peter, you gave up the microphone and then you'll get it back and you have the last word. Yeah, the last word is that I would like to propose a vote of thanks to SOAS, the COJS, and especially Dr. Peter Flugel and his team for hosting this event yet again and managing it so well. So three cheers for the team. Thank you very much. Well, I would like to pass on this uh, vote of thanks to the speakers who came from all over the world on their own cost or the cost of their universities. We learned a lot, I think, and uh, lots of uh, new ideas we have to ponder. Um, I just want to mention that I have the impression the papers were extremely good and, and, and complimentary, and it's probably possible to put a volume together 
Um, otherwise, uh, of course, we always invite uh, those who want to publish quickly to submit something for the IJJS online and in print. And, uh, well, be in touch. I think we have a system now to publish things a little bit quicker. With these uh, closing remarks, I would like to invite all the speakers uh, to the Divana restaurant where we always have our libation and uh, our uh, food, vegetarian and food. And theme of, of next conference. The theme of the next conference. Thank you, Arthur. That's very good. I mean, in collaboration with the uh, Gernsager Foundation, uh, we have already many months ago decided to have a conference on Jainism and science that is also advertised in the newsletter. And uh, I think there's an enormous pool of experts, scientists in India who have a lot to say. So that will be a major migration to SOAS at least in the next year <laughs> <laughs> from India. And we all like to hear something about nuclear physics then and its relationship to Jainism. Why? And, of course, many other things. Medical science. Whatever. Oh. We have <laughs> limited time. We have limited time, I must say. And uh, so the, some selection will be made. But nevertheless, I look forward to this. And some of the issues mentioned here, I think, I hope will be addressed at that occasion. So see you again next year. Thank you.